We have invited experts, panelists to answer questions on what makes a proactive hardware security program successful. I'm glad to welcome Helena. She's a fellow at Rambus. Charles, who is the CTO of Ledger Crypto Wallet, company based out of France, uh, and moderated by Jason, who is the co-founder and CTO of Tortuga Logic, uh, based in California. Friends, if you have questions, please send them across via Zoom chat. This session is going to be also recorded and would be for 30 minutes, followed by which the panelists and experts would take questions uh, from the chat. All right. Uh, Jason, Helena, and uh, Charles. Uh, I see y'all all on the screen. Uh, I will request our host, uh, Sparsh, to put them on spotlight so everybody can enjoy. Uh, yeah, fancy view. All right. Jason, all over to you. Awesome. I think I see everybody here. Thanks everybody for uh, for joining this morning and afternoon for some. So it's uh, it's good to see everybody here on the. Uh, on this session, um, and Dominic, it was a good uh, enjoyed the, the your session as well. Um, so just to kind of give give some context to this, uh, kind of set the stage a bit. You know, we were um, I was talking with with Charles and Helena about you know kind of the the growth in building out, you know, really looking at finding security issues early on in the design cycle. You know, whether it's building a semiconductor device in SOC or um, you know an actual hardware platform or hardware device. There's been this big movement to actually start looking at security issues and you know be more proactive when uh, you know designing in security and so we thought that'd be a really good topic to talk about you know what you know how do people go about it um what um what issues can come up in these types of th things um so that's kind of the genesis of you know kind of organizing this discussion um you know our intent is to have it pretty you know conversational so um you know i'll be a moderator but also uh, kind of chiming in um on the you know i think antrik mentioned we would this would be a 30 minute discussion but you know, throughout the, the session, please ask your questions in the in the chat and we'll take those as they come up. Um, but just to give some kind of my kind of introduction and position on this, and I'll hand it to, to Helena. Um, so, you know, I'm, as, as Antrik said, one of the founders and CTO of Tortuga Logic. Um, for those that don't know us, we build tools that help find security um, or really help bring automation to the semiconductor design process from a security standpoint. Um, and so um, we're very much focused on kind of this this topic area. Um, but, you know, from, from my side, I think, you know, it's obviously, I mentioned this briefly, we're seeing a huge growth in the number of, of hardware vulnerabilities. Um, we kind of see a, a, there's been a big surge of those in the last several years. Um, and a lot of that's attributed to, you know, growing design complexity and so on. And so really building out security proactively, I think is, from my side, is an extremely important um, kind of practice to adopt. And, um, you know, kind of my perspective on what can, what can make this successful, uh, you know, there's kind of two two pieces to this that I see. The first one is that really having a process is important, right? Security is not not something that you can just buy. Um, it's really around building a process and a methodology around how you actually take, you know, security requirements that you may have, whether it's things that you've come up internally based on your threat modeling process or something that maybe your customers really care about, you know, and then driving that secure those security requirements throughout your design lifecycle. Um, and this applies whether you're building, you know a piece of IP, an, an SOC, or an actual you know, hardware device. Um, so that's one really key thing is having that process. And the other key thing um, that I think is really important is um, basically building automation into this. Because what we see, at least from our side, is a lot of companies are building, they know they need to, have, they need to design sec security in, they know they need to be proactive, but there ends up being a lot of manual effort in that process. So you know, staring at architectural doc, uh, block diagrams, head scratching, you know, a lot of whiteboard work and kind of a best effort approach, but really building automation, we think is key to that as well. So um, that's kind of my, you know, kind of statement on it. And I guess my position, um, I'll, hand it, I'll hand it to you to kind of give your, your thoughts and then we can uh, start taking some questions or after Charles goes, of course. Yeah, sounds great. Thank you very much. I hope everybody can hear me. <laughs> Um, so, yeah, I think um, when you look at, um, historically speaking, uh, when, when we're trying to analyze security for uh, chips in particular, for hardware, right, um, it's many times been post-manufacturing. Once you have the chip, you put it under a scope, right, and you try to 
put some probes on it, you try to dig into it, you try to see if anything leaks, you try to analyze it and so on. You try to break into it after it's been done. But <clears throat> we realize now, I think for a few years already that that's just not enough. You have to start right when you design it, right when you write the code, when you put it together. So there's been a, a bigger trend towards trying to do that. Uh, so I very much agree with what Jason just said. Uh, there's a lot now of tools that you can use to analyze the code before making your chips. Uh, you can, you know, for example, run some software, hardware code analysis tools that will tag variables and check if, you know, they stay confidential during your computations and things like that all throughout the code. Um, there is a little bit of a trend towards going from checking and analyzing the source code to um, try to model security. So add security properties and characteristics that you try to model in your design and then try to formally prove that you actually achieve what you're hoping to achieve. Um, there's a, a trend towards this in, um, <clears throat> in hardware a development with tools such as Lando. That's a specific language that you can develop in that will include these security properties, for example. Uh, so that's one newer thing that we're starting to see. Uh, and then there's also um, a lot of analysis being done and that's kind of uh, a little bit more where I go into what my own company does. So uh, Rambus does <clears throat> a lot of security analysis against side channel attacks. Uh, and so there we use uh, things like our DP8 workstation where we have software running that will analyze um, the source code, or let's say the the, um, uh, the simulation of it that you put on your FPGA to see if there is any specific uh, leakage happening and where the leakage is happening, uh, and try to then, uh, you know, remediate that before the chip is even built. So that's all, uh, all the trends that we start to see and that we've been working, you know, working on these things for a little while now. Um, but as Jason said, the newest thing really is the automation of all of this. So even for side channel analysis, you know, many times it's still a little bit manual in that sense. You have to find, you know, the trigger points. You have to pretty much figure out um, how to best analyze your design before you can check for leakage and remove leakages. But uh, several other uh, institutions and mostly academic work today, I would say, before it goes into industry, uh, has started trying to build automated tools for inserting countermeasures against uh, side channel attacks, for example, uh, both in the area of um, uh, power analysis, but also fault analysis. Uh, so there's a, there's a few interesting works that have started to appear in, uh, in academia where uh, we're now trying to see tools that will do it for you. <laughs> you know, as automated as possible. It's still a little bit magical and it's not completely resolved. I think there's still a, a few things that need to be uh, improved, but that's the new trend and I think that's great. So uh, all in all, we're going towards more automation, uh, trying to have the tools do it for you as opposed to trying to do it manually because that just doesn't scale, it just doesn't scale. So that's a little bit on my perspective on things, uh, and we can talk more about any of these things later uh, uh, in the Q&A sessions or, or during the rest of the panel. Uh, but now, right now, I'd like to hand it over to Charles. Thank you very much, Elena. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm very happy to join the, the panel. So I'm going to uh, try to explain our approach for security at, at Ledger and how uh, we try to implement this uh, proactive uh, hardware security uh, program. For those who don't know uh, Ledger yet, um, Ledger is uh, one of the main actors in security for uh, digital assets. I'm sure you didn't miss this emerging technology called blockchain. Uh, from my perspective, we are at the very beginning of the blockchain revolution. And I feel a bit like uh, 1997 when the internet revolution was about to happen. We had no idea what was about to happen, but we felt something was ongoing. Uh, now we have a better idea on how uh, it, the internet changed our, our life. Uh, it's difficult to imagine uh, what this blockchain revolution will look, look like in the future, but there is something for sure. This new technology comes with uh, new major security challenges, 
because it pushed the security challenge to uh, the endpoint. Uh, maybe I, it's a general uh, sentence, but I, I'd like to, to, to give a, a concrete example. Uh, when you hold digital uh, asset, cryptocurrency, for, for instance, uh, what you uh, actually hold is a private key. If you take, for example, Bitcoin, if you lose your key, you lose your coins. Um, if an attacker gets an access to your key, he can make a transaction, he empty your wallet, and there's nothing you can do to revert it. One private key can secure 100 USD worth of Bitcoin or a billion. And this is the exact same piece of data. It's 256 bits. And I think this kind of security challenge is completely new. I mean, in the history, uh, it's quite new that 256 bits can secure a billion USD. And, uh, and if an attacker gets an access, you, can, you make a transaction and there is nothing you can do to revert. Uh, it's, it's quite a new security challenge. And that's why we, we think uh, secure hardware is the best solution to tackle this challenge. And designing secure uh, product is, is a quite difficult task as it, uh, it has been uh, already mentioned uh, several times during this, this few minutes. And from my perspective, everything starts uh, at the design phase you have to ask yourself what's your threat model. You need to make sure that your threat model is consistent with the problem you are trying to solve. Um, and this task is often minimized, but it's a lot of work. Um, and you should, shouldn't uh, only uh, be content with having it in mind. Uh, you have to write it down. And uh, this is what we did. And for the sake of transparency, because in, in, in the blockchain area, everything is transparent. Uh, we uh, publish our uh, threat model online, and I think it's, uh, it's a good practice to, to do that. So that our users can clearly understand uh, the security problem we are trying to solve with, with our product. Um, and from a user perspective, our threat model includes a high potential attacker with a physical access to the device. And that's why we use a common criteria a certified chip uh, because they are uh, especially designed for uh, this kind of threat model. Um, you also have uh, software running on top of this hardware. Uh, we often uh, talk about hardware, but uh, hardware only, it's, uh, it's not a product, it's uh, just hardware. Uh, when you want to, to, to make an application, you need soft software running on, on top of it. Um, and uh, one of the security design security practice we have is KISS. Keep it simple, stupid, minimize the attack surface. And uh, in software development, we try to implement good practices, a lot of automation, static analysis, uh, fuzzing, and so on. Uh, and we have also a dedicated team to review uh, manually with the tools also, but manually uh, the software of our code. Uh, also, these days, we are looking at Rust. Uh, there are interesting properties in Rust. I'm not an expert at all, but um, Often in uh, embedded, uh, uh, embedded firmware, we are all using uh, uh, standard uh, C language. And, uh, and in standard C language, they, you cannot guarantee a lot of things. And, uh, and Rust uh, seems a very interesting, interesting track to, to have uh, uh, higher guarantees in terms of security, memory safety, and so on. Um, and, uh, and Rust seems to be uh, quite suitable for, uh, for embedded, uh, embedded technology. So this is something we are looking at. Uh, as of now, we, we don't use it uh, a lot, but this is uh, something very uh, promising for, uh, for us. Um, also, in our threat model, uh, we, are, uh, we include uh, the genuineness of the hardware. Uh, we want to provide our user with um, a mean to verify that the hardware he has uh, in his hand is, uh, is a genuine one. And this one is quite challenging to, to achieve. Uh, what we are doing to uh, try to ensure that is to uh, insert a unique certificate uh, inside the, the secure element that we are using. Uh, and um, and this is done during during the during the manufacturing in, inside our uh, manufacturing uh, uh, offices, and and this certificate allows the device to prove uh, cryptographically uh, it's uh, genuine. Um, related to that, uh, also uh, there was the supply chain itself. Uh, security uh, of the supply chain is always a complex topic, um, and. Um, there, it's difficult to have a very technical um, a way to ensure ensure that it's a lot of process. Uh, you, you have to you have to implement the process, audit, and so on. 
Um, and related to that, uh, there is also something uh, um, which is often minimized is how uh, you ensure that the code running on your um, on your hardware is the one you, you wanted at, at, at first. And to do so, we are we are trained. We have implemented uh, some multi-signature uh, process. So we have a bootloader with uh, with a public key in order to to verify um, the signature of the firmware. And in order to avoid a single point of failure in our organization, we have impl implemented a multi-signature process where several stakeholders of the company verify the code, verify the binaries, and when uh, everyone is happy, uh, they multi-sign uh, this. Uh, uh, th this version of firmware. And finally, uh, something very important as well uh, is a, a secure update mechanism uh, of the firmware of our device, um, because uh, it's difficult and it's even impossible to be bulletproof at first, and uh, you need to have a way to update uh, what uh, your, your firmware and, uh, and your, your product. Um, and last but not least, we have a dedicated security research team, uh, which is called the uh, Dungeon, and their main mission is to improve the security of our product. And to do so, they spend a lot of time uh, and efforts uh, searching for vulnerability in our product. Um, and also, when we um, when we use third-party hardware, we start with uh, uh, analyzing the security of them. Uh, for instance, um, we are using HSM uh, in our solution, and uh, a few uh, a few years ago, we conducted when we started to use uh, uh, HSM, we conducted the security uh, analysis of them. And uh, with the one we are using today, uh, at this time, we found uh, 14 uh, vulnerabilities, if I remember correctly, even if uh, it was certified. And uh, we collaborated with the vendor in order to, um, to fix those vulnerabilities. And now uh, everything seems, uh, seems to be in a better shape. Uh, we also published those vulnerability and, um, uh, in, and presented them in, uh, in security uh, conference. Um, so to summarize, having an efficient uh, security program is not easy. There is not, not uh, only one solution uh, which uh, solves ev everything, um, but a lot of things are important. Uh, and uh, it starts with a threat model design phase, uh, choosing the right hardware component, and, uh, and finally the implementation itself from software and hardware perspective is, uh, is very important. And uh, everything related to product lifecycle, uh, development, manufacturing, distribution, uh, and uh, audits and updates is also very important. But there, it's mostly uh, managed by uh, process and organization and not that much by, uh, by technology. And this is always the part where we are less comfortable, uh, for sure. But it, this is uh, something we, we have to take into account precisely. I'm, I'm stopping. Great, thanks, I, I, I talked yeah. a lot. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> No, no, I have actually, it's, you, there's a lot of, I was taking notes. There's a lot of good things you, um, that you mentioned there. I mean, one thing you mentioned, I think that's probably interesting is, um, you know, this notion of being transparent, right? So, you know, obviously historically, like, you know, cryptography came to be with the, the secrecy of the algorithms and everybody was breaking the algorithms. And then, then it was, you know, moved to transparent algorithms and keep the key secrets, right? Um, and, and, you know, just from a broad perspective in security, that, that tends to be the best approach, right? Being transparent about what you're doing, your process, you know. But I guess the question I'd have is how far do you take that, right? Because it's like, do you fully give everybody your source code, <laughs> you know, or do you just give more transparency about what you're building in your process and so on? Um, so maybe, uh, you know, ask Helena you that question first. I know you're heavily involved in the the risk five security standing committee and other things. So I'm sure that you have some good perspective on this too. Yeah, I, I think uh, you're completely right. I mean, I also just thought of, you know, crypto as an example, it all started with proprietary or very secret algorithms. And then a little bit of a revolution, maybe 30, 40 years ago, suddenly, you know, the world opened up a little bit and said, okay, why don't we start publishing our algorithms, have everybody look at them, make sure that we get the best algorithms out there. Um, and keep only the key as the secret, which is the minimum. <laughs> um, and then by every, having everybody participate in cryptanalysis and everything that actually made you know, the world a better place in some sense. So um, I'm actually super excited to see the same starting to happen in hardware uh, design and, and um, uh, seeing you know, organizations like RISC-5 since you know, I'm uh, 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 happily uh, uh, chairing the, the security committee until about yesterday. 
pretty uh, stunning to chair starting uh, today or tomorrow. But uh, in the last three years, that's what I've tried to advocate, which is to say, well, if you have open source, then everybody can look at it. And yes, it takes a bit of time and, you know, it'll, you know, it's standardization. So maybe it'll take a few more years, but uh, at least everybody can look at it and <clears throat> people can give their feedback. They find you know, more eyes looking at it will find more vulnerabilities faster and then they can, can feed it back to the organization and then the organization can take care of that by trying to evolve the specs, add, add better extensions, fix the, fix the issues. Um, of course, it's a double-edged uh, sword because, you know, once everybody uses the same standard and somebody finds a bug, then a security bug, then you know that, you know, pretty much everybody that's using it uh, is somewhat exposed. Um, <clears throat> but that's, I think, a little risk that people can take. And, uh, and uh, over the long term, we will um, have many more uh, benefits from doing open source, uh, publishing everything we do and showing everything uh, in the open so that everybody can sec check for themselves and can also make sure that uh, because they have perhaps different threat models that some things are important for them, some other things may be less. And so everybody can can make their own opinion. So yeah, totally. New trend is open sourcing everything. I've cited risk five. I can cite open Titan. Uh, I can say uh, open hardware alliance, all of that. Uh, so yeah, go for it, and it'll take a few years, but we'll we'll have a better outcome, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe I can comment also about that, uh, and. Uh... I agree with uh, what you just said. There was this big, big move towards to uh, more transparency. This is a this is a trend, and I think definitely it's uh, it's very positive. It started a long time ago, as you said. The cryptography at first was something uh, completely uh, completely not open, uh, completely closed, and there was this uh, Kirchhoff principle that we learn at school now, um, and uh, and it's a, it's a good thing. Also, software uh, is going to is also embracing this uh, this trend, uh, going to uh, more openness more transparency uh, and blockchain this is uh, this is uh, completely crazy if you are not completely transparent pe people are just uh, freaking out and uh, and this is this is the, the very nature of, of, of uh, blockchain technology and uh, and this this ecosystem uh, it's at first it's a bit disturbing but uh, you you quickly see all the other advantage uh, of that um, hardware is a bit behind. Uh, we we have to we have, we have to admit that there are a couple of uh, initiatives in that direction. Uh, with, um, uh, for instance, with this uh, uh, incredible rise of embedded device, uh, we have ARM, ARM cores. They took all the markets, and uh, the open source community tried uh, to strike back with uh, Risk Five core, uh, and uh, definitely it's a it's a great initiative. Uh, but at the end, it's only a core and an instruction set. You you don't have a, a full product uh, already. Um, if if we would, would like to to do a completely open source IC, uh, it would improve uh, auditability. Uh, nevertheless, uh, it doesn't grant, guarantee that someone competent actually audits the code. Uh, it's auditable, but it does not mean that people will audit them because auditing uh, uh, hardware is not that easy. And also, there is a very big difference uh, with uh, open source software. With open source software, I can go on GitHub, I download the code. And I audit it and, and run it, and I know that the code which is running on my computer is the one I uh, is the one I audited, and I, I'm happy with that. Uh, it brings more security, at least more auditability, uh, and uh, and I'm happy with that. For hardware, it's not that easy. How do I know that the circuit I have uh, in my hand uh, is the exact same uh, which has been produced from the code I audited? Uh, this, this is something which is very difficult to achieve. achieve. Um, in a world where uh, EDA tools were open source, uh, security countermeasures uh, were public and not patented because uh, there is a lot of patents uh, around, and uh, everyone, everyone could run uh, its own foundry at home, uh, the design of an open source uh, security would, would definitely uh, fill the hole we would like to, to fill uh, with this, uh, this openness. But for now, uh, this is mostly a dream. And um, again, I'm, I'm in favor of open source in general. I think uh, it brings a lot of value. It brings a lot of um, auditability and uh, often security. 
but for hardware, it's uh, definitely not sufficient to only have uh, um, uh, open hardware uh, design. And um, yeah, it, it would bring, uh, as it is now, it would be bring very little in terms of, uh, of security, uh, while it prevents uh, you from using uh, secure elements. Secure elements are not um, open source, and, uh, and even when you run code on them, you cannot open source your, your code. This is a big limitation. But uh, you have uh, you you can benefit of uh, all this uh, security from this closed world. Uh, for me, I'm a, I'm I'm a bit in a difficult situation where I would like this uh, secure element to be open source, more open, and so on. But I prefer to have security, and I cannot I cannot have both. I, I'm a bit uh, disappointed by that. See, I was gonna. Say, I mean, I think um, I, I you know. I was slightly, I think I agree mostly with both of you, but I have slightly a caveat to that, right? So I think the one, what the, what the hardware industry I think really needs, at least initially, is, um, at least on the semiconductor side, is kind of references to actually build secure foundations, right? So I, I really like the Open Titan initiative because it's like, here's an architecture, here's how you talk about a root of trust, here's how you talk about, you know, um, you know, secure boot and, you know, management of all your design assets and these types of things that kind of a more of a transparent way. So I think that initiative of being open of like, here's what you should do. Here's what is secure, what is not, you know, here's a good practice and here's what's not is, is really important. When it gets to the point of actual source code, I think being transparent so someone can audit, it's important, but I don't necessarily think that fully open source where people are openly contributing is going to necessarily lead to a more secure outcome, primarily because I, the way I think the good model would be there's a reference design available. And that's what I like about, you know, obviously the whole risk five initiative is because it's like, here's a standard and you can take it and then you can come, you build your own thing. Cause I think a lot of, you know, when there's, when a business has, um, you know, money on the line and impact of if there's a problem, they're going to take different measures to build that into their products in a, in a, in a way that should be secure. I mean, that's obviously one of the trends we see is people building more proactive security program, but I think just relying, um, I, the, the worry I'd have is that, you know, people would just contribute to this in a more of an open manner. And then problems come up uh, that are very vast. And it's, it's like, it, there's no central responsibility on who to resolve it. Right. Um, that, that's not to say that, that, that can't work, but there's a, th that, that's a hard, you know, problem to solve, I think. And then, but like I said, the, at the front end of that, being transparent in architectures and process and so on, um, you know, is, is, is extremely valuable because that education piece as a foundation is just lacking. There's this, there's a, you know, that I've, from our customer side, there's some that are really sophisticated that just are leading and they may not even know they're leading, but they're just really good. Just historically with what the markets they've been working in. And then we have others that you think should be, but they're, they're not. So it's, there's this broad spectrum, but so having that kind of transparency around, you know, here's how you build a foundational security into your products. Um, and everybody kind of, follows along, not necessarily a standard, but just follows along kind of that best practice, then I think that that would go a long way uh, initially. Yeah, I think, you know, people have a tendency to, whenever they're sure of themselves, so to speak, to the point that you can prove properties of something and that you can uh, automate the analysis and do stuff like that, then it gets published because we're ready, so to speak. <laughs> Um, but whenever there's still a little bit of doubt and we're not quite so sure and, and you know, maybe it's not quite as perfect and as secure as we would love it to be, um, there's still a little bit of a tendency to keep things, you know, a bit obscured and a bit proprietary. And that's fine because sometimes we don't have those proofs and, and we can't mathematically show that it, it is actually okay and it still relies on obscurity. Um, but we try to go as far as possible by standardizing things, by opening things up as, as much as possible. And there's still a lot of research to be done on doing it for uh, all of the different topics out there. <laughs> uh, and we'll just make progress in that direction. And maybe someday we will have an open source, uh, you know, a secure element. Who knows? Yeah, yeah. Maybe. Just a very, very quick comment. And there, there was a, a very interesting side effect of uh, open sourcing code. Uh, it raises the bar in terms of expectation from the developers. When developers know they will publish their, their source online, uh, they, they have more expectation and they produce better code. And this is something I can see uh, every day to day uh, in my organization. Uh, this is a side effect, but uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good one. And then uh, I would just encourage other folks to ask uh, 
questions in the chat if you have any questions for us and I'll, I'll go ahead and uh, field those. But um, there, this is a, 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 a derivation from this topic. I mean, I think the, the transparency open source one's really interesting. Um, and it's obviously interesting for hardware in general because the semiconductor industry is so kind of closed off Right, historically, um, but then obviously from a security perspective, it's it's adds that extra layer on top of that. Um, but kind of shifting gears a bit, I think uh, Helena, both you and Charles brought this up around um, power side channels. Um, you know, what I guess looking at that proactively, and obviously historically, it's been buy an IC, you know, give it to a lab or just do it internally. You know, use an EM probe, clip some leads. You know, obviously, a lot of the security business unit at, at Rambus came from the the heart of, of power side channel analysis, right? But it, how do we, you know, what sort of work can be done to find those issues earlier on? Because obviously if you've taped out a bunch of silicon and you find an issue, you know, you find your parts vulnerable after the fact, you know, you, maybe you can mitigate some of it with software, you know, best effort. Um, but, you know, it's, 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 it's a lot more challenging once you get to that point. So I guess, what are your thoughts on what we could do to, to drive that more as part of the design process to find things earlier? Maybe I'll, yeah, I'll start with you, Helena. There, there's, you know, there's two schools out there, as we say in French, I guess. <laughs> there's one school that teaches to check after you've built your IC and you give it to the best experts in the labs out there and they come, come along with their best tools and best techniques and they try to break in. And their goal is really to extract the key. That's really what, uh, what they're after, right? So if they can't break it, essentially, then you get a stamp which says, you know, we're some of the best labs out here. We can't break it. And if we can't break it, you're good to go. <laughs> That's one school, you know, one, one train of thought, I guess, is the equivalent in English. <laughs> um, the other uh, train of thought here or, or methodology is to do it ahead of time. And that's something that, um, at Rambus, we've been working on for quite a little bit, which is try to prove as much as you can. You can't completely prove it, but try to model and prove as much as you can before uh, uh, building your IC that it doesn't leak. And that's different from key extraction, right? We're not going after the key, really. We're not trying to break it. What we're trying to do is to show that there are no leaks, uh, at least not in the most important spots and, and the most important intermediate variables in, in crypto algorithms that we develop. So uh, we've called this uh, testing methodology, if you want a test vector leakage uh, assessment. Uh, so we've published quite a few, uh, a few papers on, you know, for different crypto algorithms. Uh, here is how you analyze this algorithm. Here's the test vectors you should use. And here is, you know, um, a way of showing that there's no leakage, at least for those intermediates and, and, and kind of it behaves no different from random data. That means I can't extract any information out of it. That's kind of the approach that we've tried to use. And um, I think it complements the post silicon analysis uh, um, uh, very well. Um, it's being currently standardized by ISO. There's a, a, a specification out there already. I think it's ISO 17825 or something like that, uh, which uh, will perhaps soon get picked up by NIST. Uh, NIST uh, is, is the one publishing um, the uh, FIPS 140-3 specifications for security, and they have uh, provisions in there to link to that ISO document when when everybody's ready and you know technology is ready and everybody's good to go then they will make that link I'm pretty sure so it does complement things there's you know you can do both do a little bit pre silicon analysis that removes the biggest uh, worries you might have uh, and then make sure that after the fact your um, your chips are still secure enough by uh, performing some, some good old key extraction experiments on it and make sure you get the stamp from the lab. So there's room for both. Um, and I think using both these methods will get you the, the best result in some sense. Now, the little caveat is that we're doing it for crypto, right? It's crypto algorithms, which have been so well studied and uh, we all know how this works. Uh, and we know, you know that the intermediate values are super important, shouldn't be revealed and so on. But okay, what test vector leakage assessment would you do for a full root of trust? What would you, how would you go about standardizing something like that for a much bigger circuit, for much bigger elements, not just the crypto? Now that's the big open question. And I think we're probably years away from having an answer to that. 
Maybe a, a quick question, uh, just to complement what you what you just said. What, what I would uh, recommend when you design your IC and you want to to have security, you can uh, implement uh, uh, a lot of tools in order to have more guarantees uh, beforehand, and it's a good idea because it's difficult to iterate uh, your IC. It costs a lot in terms of uh, money and and time. Uh, but I, what I would recommend is to have a flexible implementation in terms of software, so that you you are able after you. Your, your IC is produced to, to add more um, noise, more, uh, there, there are plenty of, uh, of different contamination, but your, your hardware design needs to be able to, 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 to add this countermeasure afterwards, uh, depending on the, on the actual security assessment. But uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit curious on, uh, on, on, on the tool you, you mentioned, uh, how does it work? Do you, um, do you try to model the leakage in a, a from an electronic uh, electric, uh, power, consumption, power consumption perspective, or is it more logical? You uh, you are looking at the value uh, which are located in the flip flop, and uh, and you you just uh, uh, compare this leakage uh, against uh, something uh, random. Yeah, you actually you put your design on an FPGA, for example, or you load okay. you can do software as well. You load it, you know, on uh, on a platform that is your preferred platform of choice, and then you analyze. Um, the traces that you obtain during execution and during uh, um, while the algorithms are running. And then you compare, you, you do statistical tests to compare that against distributions where, you know, you don't have any knowledge up front of anything that you're dealing with or any specific, specific values or so. So you use the statistical t-test to, to uh, compare distributions. Uh, and if you can't tell the difference because uh, they look alike and there's, you know, statistically that um, there's a way to show that <laughs> uh, to, to a certain uh, a percentage of, of precision, um, you try to show that you can't tell the difference between what you're measuring, what you're looking at on your screen, what the power traces look like, and something that would be completely random or there would be no interesting information in it. So that's what you try to do. Okay, so if I understand correctly, the tool you mentioned uh, in order to characterize your secret beforehand uh, is using using an FPGA implementation. Uh, am I correct? Yeah, if you if you're developing hardware, you use an FPGA, which of course is not exactly the same as the final the final chip. Right? There will be differences, but it's a it's a pretty good uh, first uh, approach to yeah, it. Sure. So you put it on an FPGA, or in case of you know C code, if you want to analyze C code, you'll put it on a different board that was one one of your platforms of choice. Yeah, and then you do just regular DPA analysis on it, and then you compare it with specific test vectors that should uh, not allow you to say anything better than I have no idea what the key might be here, or I I, I have I don't see any intermediate values that you know stick out. <laughs> It's all public, know, right? The um, standards out there, and, and you can you can look it up. Yeah, I think there's a there's a, yeah on TVLA there's some really good material if you start poking around. Um, the uh, so I think we're out of time, I believe, on or close to it. So I mean, I know that uh, we didn't get any questions from the audience, so maybe I'll I'd love to to sit for a a, a minute to to give folks a, an opportunity to ask uh, questions if there are any. Uh, in the meantime, Charles, do you want to let us know, because I know that uh, you have run a hardware bug bounty program for your device. So how mm -hmm. do you encourage people to participate in such activities? Because uh, you need to have equipments, you need to have tools at home. Uh, and then how do you quantify if the bug is in a chip, which is a third party and not produced by you as an OEM, who is responsible to fix it? Who is responsible when it comes to if a chip is being uh, certified uh, by you know whatever standards are out there? So can you throw some light on that? Yeah, sure. Uh, yes, we are running a bounty program for uh, for our devices. Uh, as the threat model is uh, is public, uh, the security researcher can have a look to the to the threat model and and try to find a vulnerability which uh, which fits uh, with with uh, this uh, this threat model. And um, 
and um, yeah, it, 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 so uh, for now it works. It works pretty pretty well. Uh, we have uh, we have uh, several security researcher uh, which found interesting vulnerabilities uh, on our product. Sometimes it's um, it's very hardware, and we have to update the firmware in order to uh, to add more countermeasure in order to 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 mitigate um, the the site channel leakage or to mitigate a fault attacks or or anything. Uh, sometimes it's uh, it's a very uh, it's very software because we are implementing some uh, uh, blockchain protocol uh, at the um, at the hardware device level. So this is also something which uh, which happen. Um, and uh, yeah, it, it depends. That there are plenty of uh, they are all published on on, the, on on our website, and there are plenty of interesting vulnerabilities. And uh, and depending on the criticality, depending on the on the beauty of the of the vulnerability which has been found, uh, we we give a, a different amount of uh, of money, and we pay in Bitcoin, of course. Uh, yeah, and it works pretty well, uh, and uh, it's it's quite uncommon to have a um, um, bounce, bouncy program for uh, for hardware. It's uh, really more um, uh, famous for for software, but uh, for hardware, it's not that uh, that often. But it works pretty well. It takes it takes some time, but uh, at the end, it improves the security of our product uh, definitely. Charles, I hope you deliver the uh, the Bitcoin in a ledger wallet. <laughs> <laughs> we send we send we send it to to a, a Bitcoin address, uh, but we recommend <laughs> we recommend them to secure this uh, on the on the ledger of devices. All right. So, uh, go ahead. Ahead, I think we're going to say the same thing. So you go ahead. Okay. Uh, uh, I have a question for you, Jason. If that's okay, I know you've been moderating it, but I would like to ask you. Uh, I know sure. that you've been working with a lot of uh, government agencies, especially with the U.S. So we've seen in the software space uh, attacks uh, and state-sponsored attacks or backdoors like Solar Wind and stuff like that. Uh, have you seen uh, any massive uh, implementation of? Uh, hardware that is backdoored or do you think that the government is really uh, uh, concerned about hardware backdoors and at to what extent because in the media or in public there's no mention of a really active uh, hardware which is backdoored and compromised or state sponsored we've just like in Dominic's session we had about the Bloomberg stuff right he mentioned but uh, your thoughts on this what you've been seeing and talking with the government Yes, like I mean, I guess what I would say is yes, the there is concern about about this problem space, right? Hardware backdoors. Um, there was a, somebody from the government that uh, had an interesting line that, you know, if someone sat you down and said, "Would you bet national security on the security of this device?" Um, and you had to say yes. <laughs> um, you really want to make sure that you're uh, you're covering all bases, right? So, um, so I think yes, it is definitely a concern. Um, and do I personally think it's a viable attack vector? Yes, um, for certain applications. Um, I mean, there's just a lot of, I mean, even from the simplest side, you could, this is independent of, of you know, government, but if you think about it, if you had an adversary that found a set of different weaknesses in a, in a you know, say they were working in an organization and they found a bunch of different bugs um, and they didn't disclose what those were, you know, maybe they're in the, the design itself or in the firmware. Um, you know, you could easily replicate that in the field or sell that to a foreign, you know, uh, uh, another nation or what have you, right? So um, I think it's definitely an important problem space. Um, and uh, these are these are definitely big concerns. Yeah, and it, it goes back to uh, to what I uh, mentioned before. Uh, you you might have a very uh, strict development uh, development life cycle. You can be sure that your GDS2 is... Uh, is uh, Backdoor free, I would say. Uh, when you receive, when you send you, when you send your GDS2 to, to TSMC or Samsung or any any foundry, and you you go back, uh, you get back your 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 silicon. Uh, it's very difficult to to be sure uh, that uh, the, the silicon uh, corresponds to uh, to, the, to to your design, especially for a very advanced node technology. If it's uh, an old technology, you can you can uh, take a sample, try to reverse it, and uh, and try to compare it with uh, your, your GDS two. But for a very advanced uh, technology node, it's uh, simply not possible. Yeah, and then if you look at just this, you know, even a very simple attack vector as it relates to supply chain. I mean, 
counterfeits, even in the sense of just finding a part that was in a junkyard, redrawing the, you know, the, the markings of, you know, how the grade of the part, you know, when it was manufactured, the part number. Um, I think it was, um, uh, uh, I can't recall. Uh, anyway, I, I saw this, uh, a talk. Um, oh, yeah, Joe, Joe Fitzpatrick, who I think has participated in hardware in the past, but, mm -hmm. you know, talking about the, you know, taking, repurposing an IC and just kind of changing the way it's laid out and it'll actually perform, you know, different functions. And, you know, I've, there's parts that just, it's a plastic, it's the package with leads, but there's no dye in it. Right. And people will buy and put it in a board and they're like, this doesn't work. Right. It's because there's nothing in it. Right. So that is definitely a, and obviously a, a very, a very big problem. I think Dominic touched on some of that as well. So. Yeah. And I think if you think about the solution to it, it's, uh, it's, it's a bit overwhelming, right? It, mean, it means that almost every tiny little piece of silicon needs an ID in it, perhaps some lightweight crypto or something equivalent to that. It's okay. It's a big task. <laughs> Still a big task at hand. So I don't think we had any questions, at least from the audience, but hopefully uh, I'm assuming that we answered everything and everybody was a uh, was very satisfied. So, but I thank you all. I guess you know, Helena, thank you, and Charles, thank you, and Antrix, thank you for uh, for uh, you know, helping organize this. So it was a it was a good discussion, and we could we could talk for hours, I'm sure, about this. So we have we had a lot of topics we wanted to touch on. We touched on a fraction of them, but it, I think it was still interesting. So yeah, thanks for organizing it. Good time. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely very interesting. Thank you. Thank you very very much, uh, everybody. Thank you so much, Jason, uh, Helena, and Charles for sharing your experience and learnings with us. Uh, most of our audience did uh, enjoy it. Uh, I can see thank you uh, in the chat boxes multiple times. And friends, uh, if you like today's uh, panel, uh, please give a shout out to our panelists and experts. Uh, they are easily available and findable on LinkedIn and Twitter. Uh, also, uh, we will be sharing a feedback form after the session. So please send in your feedback. Uh, tell us what you liked and what you didn't like so that we could improve uh, in delivering such amazing content to you guys uh, in our future editions. Uh, last but uh, last a short, quick announcement. Uh, join us for our conference uh, next week, uh, 5th to the 10th. Uh, we have four days of trainings and two days of conference talks. Amazing lineup of speakers, uh, trainings we have, and CTFs. Uh, so until next week, uh, stay safe, everybody. And uh, thank you again for joining us for today's session. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye.